Uh, so I'm, I'm Roland. I am the product manager at Agoric, and I've been at Agoric uh, since I, I think October of 2020 or so, and spent a bunch of time on my own in the Web3 space before that. Um, my background prior to all that is uh, product management and largely sort of building new products for B2B and also uh, some consumer level stuff. Uh, and then uh, business due diligence for private equity before that. So taken taken kind of a, a long road to get here and seen seen a lot of different parts of the economy and just so so excited to be in the space at this point. Um, so I guess just as a as a high level overview, w- what I want to do today in the short time that we have is go over a few of the specific tools that Agoric gives you as a developer to let you rapidly compose secure smart contracts, um, talk in enough depth to give you a sense of how they work without going into way too much detail. Um, you know, there, our documentation is pretty extensive. So anyone that wants to go deeper, you know, if there's time for questions at the end or, you know, please, please come look at the documentation or, or engage with us on Discord. Uh, but I want to give you a sense of how these things work and, and enough to let your mind sort of, uh, you know, imagine the possibilities, so to speak. Uh, And then talk a little bit about how those patterns may contrast with how things work in uh, Web3 development in other blockchains, so specifically Ethereum. Uh, For those of you that are either already aware of Ethereum development uh, or have done it yourself, you know, there are some mindset shifts that Agoric forces but allows you to have, uh, which are important, and I want to at least touch on those. And then uh, lastly give you a sense of you know ideas of where to start if you did want to start building uh on agoric so that that's sort of my my high level goal uh and jeff you know if any questions or anything to add uh happy to happy to let you chime in happy to thank you i'm, I'm listening attentively okay all right that's great um so I, I guess just as quick background uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Agoric, I know we've had we've had a couple speakers over the course of a few days, so I'll, I'll just be brief here. Um, we're a proof of stake blockchain built with the Cosmos SDK, and we're connected to the Inner Blockchain Communication Protocol (IBC). Um, and most importantly, for the purpose of this talk, we're launching our own virtual machine, asset framework, and smart contract framework all in JavaScript. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about those frameworks and, and how they work. Um, okay. And, and then after that, we can get into higher level constructs beyond that. So to start with, uh, we've got an asset framework that we call uh, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol. and you can think of ERTP as controlling how assets are created, burned, held, and transferred, right? So ERTP really defines that layer of, of building on a blockchain, which is, you know, again, the, the critical part there is coming to consensus over uh, how assets work. And ERTP in Agoric really controls how those things happen. So. Um, to go through some of the specific ERTB con- constructs, a new asset is created with a mint, and a given mint can only create one type of asset, and only one mint can create an asset of a given type. So basically, one to one for for a given asset, you really only have one mint that can create it. Uh, we refer to an asset type as a brand, uh, and then an issuer is used to operate on assets created by the associated mint and to verify that those assets are validly of the expected brand. Um, So just like a mint, there's only one issuer for a given brand and only one brand per issuer. So if you think of it, basically for any given asset, you've got one mint, one issuer, and one brand that work with it. Um, And those are the things that underneath the layer of the developer, they control how uh, assets are created and managed. Okay. So asset creation happens through mints issuers and mints and issuers, um, but ERTB also defines how assets can get transferred, which is actually a, a, an important departure from what you see in other uh, Web3 development areas. So uh, just to go through the specific transfer mechanisms, an asset uh, assets are held by users and contracts in what we call a purse. And the creation of purses is done by an issuer. So the issuer that's connected to the Minton brand also creates and manages purses. Uh, And anyone interacting with, for example, the asset of the brand run will have, can have multiple purses that are multiple run purses that got created by the run issuer and the run mint controls the creation of run. Okay. To move an asset between purses. So in, in a, 
to do, conduct a transfer, what you actually do is you de uh, deposit value into a payment. And th so that payment value is deducted from a purse and a payment has a recipient and only the recipient can deposit that payment into the recipient's purse. So we've now defined sort of how a transfer can actually occur with value inside ERTP. So you have a purse that holds an asset of a specific brand. Um, so say I've got 100 run. If I want to send 50 run to Jeff here, I in code create a, per, a payment with 50 run in it. I send that payment to Jeff. Um, Jeff receives the payment object. Using the issuer, he can verify that yes, this is truly run, which he expects to receive. And then using the mechanisms in ERTP, he can deposit that payment into his purse, which then burns the payment and ensures that the value is conserved between um, the payment object and his purse value change. So thanks for sending it. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, Jeff. Uh, you've done a great job, and I think you deserve 50 run. So thank you. <laughs> um, and and so again, you know, I I don't want to go too deep into this, but that hopefully gives a, a quick overview of what ERTP provides at, uh, in the Agoric smart contract framework layers. And um, I, have a, I have a quick question, Roland, that, that might help some of the audience. So are there sure. kind of analogies to ERTP or things people might be familiar with in relation to ERTP that can help them frame, you know, what, what ERTP is doing? You know, are there examples, um, you know, maybe yes. you have other examples in this space or or the way people might be thinking of, you know, asset transfers traditionally. Yes, and and actually, rather than giving something that's similar, um, I think it's it's maybe useful to contrast it with what people may be used to if they're familiar uh, with Ethereum and the ERC twenty standard. Um, so in in Ethereum, most fungible tokens are created using the ERC twenty standard, which you know was was written in you know several years ago and uh i think there's a open zeppelin implementation of it that's the primary thing that gets used um and if you look at that erc20 standard that actually defines what happens with asset transfer so mm -hmm. w when you are copy pasting the code into your contract for erc20 you are effectively re-implementing asset transfer in in the code for that contract and what what asset what it means to actually hold an asset in in the ethereum world is you have a balance in the contract which has a value associated with it and to modify that balance you need to have authority to change change the balance in that particular contract here what's happening actually is that you have value stored sort of somewhat locally right um where value is transferred and you have control of a purse that has an amount of value in it um and so rather than, you know, if you're creating a new asset on Agoric, rather than having to re-implement how transfer occurs and what the rules are around that and making sure that rights are conserved every time a transfer happens and that um, value isn't lost, all of that happens underneath the hood at the ERTP level, which ensures that if I'm sending a payment to Jeff, um, that, pay that payment either gets there and he receives it and the payment itself gets burned, or, or it fails in some fashion and I get it back. Um, and so that's sort of an important distinction is just thinking about how in, in other frameworks, specifically building on Ethereum, you're, you are re-implementing these low level constructs, which include transfer, which allows you as a developer to accidentally mess it up, right? You know, I think there's plenty of people that have done it, you know, used ERC20, implemented it correctly, um, but then the temptation is always there to say, oh, I, I'd like this additional functionality uh around transfer and now suddenly you have a bug in your code and something something happens which you know if you look at look at hacks it's sort of roughly once every couple of weeks something something connected to something like this is occurring um okay and, and i'll go into a little more detail uh as well as i go into uh, start talking about zoe and how that differs from for example uniswap swap transfer is that does that answer the question though santi yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, yeah, I think just keeping kind of a high level framework for some of the audience that might, might not be too familiar with the specifics of some of the, you know, some of the Web3 terminology, that's it. That, that'd be super helpful. Yep, that makes sense. Um, I guess think of it this way, which is asset creation, transfer, validation, that all is provided for you as part of the Agoric framework. And as a developer, you don't need to worry about it. Um, you can just implement it. Um, okay. All right. So uh, 
ERTP is probably, as a developer on Agoric, ERTP is the lowest layer you probably have to interact with. Uh, the other area that I mentioned is the smart contract framework, which we call Zoe, uh, which is named after a character in Firefly uh, long before I joined, so I don't know the full history there. Um, but uh, in, I guess Zoe provides a couple things to you as a developer, but the, the, core, th the core thing that it provides and mindset shift that's important is that uh, it gives you what we call offer safety. And as a, I, I guess, as a contrast again to the Web3 world, uh, you know, the existing Web3 world, uh, it, most blockchains, the basic unit of interaction is a transfer. So I'm sending some asset to some other address. Um, and you may have heard Dean talk about this in, in one of the earlier talks uh, this week. In, in Agoric, our basic unit of interaction is a, uh, an exchange. And so I'll, I'll sort of go into a little bit of a, an explanation of how Uniswap works to Uniswap being the, one of the primary uh, automated market makers on Ethereum. I'll give an example of how that works and, and contrast it a little bit if that's helpful. Yeah, so, definitely. please. Yeah. So when you make a transaction on Uniswap, you are saying, send my money of this to token type to Uniswap swap in function. And then effectively, you're, you are hoping that Uniswap processes things correctly and money comes out and you receive it in your, uh, you know, a separate token comes out and you get it in, in your wallet. Um, and it's actually worse than that. It's, uh, you're not just sending money, you're making two transactions. The first transaction says, I will approve the Uniswap contract to manage the token contract of the token I'm trying to trade. What you're doing is you're giving the Uniswap contract an allowance that it can spend on your behalf um, for a token value. Uh, and then you're making a second transaction which says, okay, I've given you this allowance, so now use it to spend it in this way, which is send it to this, this swap in function that you have. Um, and you know, with Uniswap, for it's been running effectively since 2019 and you know people trust it because it has worked for a very long time uh and i think that it, that's that's usually how these these systems work but it's kind of when you really break it down to think about it you're you're giving access to your assets to a contract that you don't know and then you are sending money to a function and then hoping that the, the right stuff happens and something else that you wanted to happen happens on the other end, right? You get the, the amount of tokens that you asked for. Um, nowhere in that flow did you say, actually, what I, what I need on the other side is this amount. You send that into Uniswap and you hope that Uniswap processes it correctly, uh, but there's nothing else that guarantees that. On the Agoric side, uh, the way we've implemented our, our basic unit of interaction is through an offer, which says, in your wallet, when you are approving that you want to take an action, you are saying, I will give you X if and only if you give me Y back. And then the Zoe con smart contract layer makes sure that an offer is only satisfied if one of those things happen. Either you get, you get what you wanted, Y, or you get your X back. Um, and so that that fundamental layer of assurance at the Zoe level means that we sort of remove a huge, huge set of possible bugs for developers. Now, obviously, it's still possible to construct something that would steal a user's assets or give them an asset that they, you know, trick them into taking the wrong asset in their want or something along those lines. But it's much harder to do it accidentally. And I think that that ends up being a really important uh, shift in frameworks. So, um, yeah, and, and so to, to look at that the Uniswap example again, you don't have to give approval for any other contract to control your assets at any time. Um, you know, your transaction specifies both what you will give and what you will receive. And um, even if the code written between the swap in and swap out functions on the Uniswap equivalent is buggy or compromised in some way, the smart contract framework ensures that you get back what you gave or you got what you wanted. Um, and in a lot of cases, what this actually means is that the contract code itself never actually has any control over your assets. Uh, it has it has control over the rules for how re assets can get reallocated, uh, but you as the user are the primary decision maker on, do I accept this reallocation or not? Uh, and so that's really what we mean by offer safety. And uh, so I'll, I'll take a, a, a pause there. 
Any any questions on that, or is there anything else that would be helpful to expand on? And happy to take you know listener questions too. And I would encourage people to tweet questions to Blue Lava so we could actively be looking for questions in in the flow on Twitter. Um, do you see anything, Santi? Uh, no, no. I think you keep going. Not right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this is really interesting. Great. Okay. All right. So just to just to summarize, sort of where I've been then. Um, ERTP provides control over minting, holding, and transferring of assets, and Zoe uh, provides protection around asset exchange. So with those levels of um, assurance around how the system can function and how users can behave and how contract developers can think of not only their own code, but third-party code that they, want my, they might want their users to be interacting with, we we believe fundamentally that that's going to unleash a whole new level of composition that just really isn't possible right now because because there is so much control at the low level. Um, and so you know I, I think Dean, our our CEO, often often likens it to memory safety in computing. You know, there's a lot of times where writing in a non-memory safe language is important because you need you know, absolute speed or or something along those lines, but it was so difficult to write composable software and to avoid bugs when you had control of those over those low level elements. Um, we think that there is sort of a, a, a strong analog here with asset creation management and transfer. Um, and so, you know, the, the one other piece to, to mention before I sort of move on to higher level constructs is uh, that I, I've been using a lot of fungible token examples, you know, money or or just tokens that people are used to to thinking about but ertp and zoe also operate um on nfts as well um so you know fungible tokens non-fungible tokens semi-fungible tokens all are managed through this framework um, and all can interact in consistent predictable and hopefully much more secure ways okay um so i i'll, I'll move on now to higher order composition and what does Agoric provide it, you know, to you as a developer uh, in this realm? So uh, I'm going to I'm going to just take one one example here, which is uh, as a developer, when you're deploying code to the Agoric chain, you do that with Zoe by creating what we call an installation. And an installation is a representation of the code on on chain. And that code, importantly, can be instantiated multiple times. So it means that you have a canonical contract on chain, which may have parameters that are changeable by governance or something along those lines that can get instantiated hundreds of times if necessary. Um, and you know, to be more concrete, a lending protocol could could get installed on chain with different governance parameters for how assets get added, uh, how uh, the actual interest rates get changed, things along those lines. And then, you know, after it gets battle tested for two years, could be instantiated by somebody new that that wants different choices, right? Um, you see, in in Ethereum, uh, Compound was an early lending protocol, and uh, Cream came along, and you know, I, I think the code is is quite different, but their their models effectively differed in the sense of Compound has been very slow to add assets because they want to be very uh, secure and they want to be very sure that they're only adding assets that are are stable whereas cream has basically just said nope we're gonna we're gonna go nuts and add whatever assets we can uh and sort of operate that way and that's something that you know on agoric that could happen quite easily without having to rewrite the whole lending code um you know you could at least be sure that the code that's been operating for a year that you now instantiate with new parameters uh is still is still the same code and is strong um, so beyond beyond the contract level, uh, we also want to allow smaller smaller units of code called components that to be installable on chain as well. Um, so as an example of how we're using this in our in our own contracts that we're launching, we have a a, a stable token vault vault contract uh, that sort of operates similarly to MakerDAO, and it has a liquidation contract which can be swapped out. Right, so it uses a certain liquidation methodology uh, to start with, but we know that as the market evolves and uh, as new things become possible, we'll want to change that. And so uh, that is 
something that's changeable on chain um, and could be instantiated. And I'm getting a couple messages that say that my audio is not coming through all that well. I uh, oh. just want to. Uh, I'm hearing, I'm hearing you well. fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So whoever messaged me, then it is it is just <laughs> you, I guess. <laughs> and I will say I, I was having some tech issues before when I was not a speaker. But then when I was made a speaker, it became better. And I don't know if that was related or not. Um, okay. Um, so. So I, I've sort of gone through installation and instantiation and that that you can see, I'm, I'm sure people on the call can imagine how that starts to become an ecosystem of components that are battle tested and hardened in in production and reused effectively. Um, but one of the things that we're really excited about doing is extending that capability with uh, insurance. And so Agoric has been working with Realm, which is a uh, regulated smart contract insurance uh, or a regulated insurance company. And um, they are offering the first or one of the first um, insurance contracts or in insurance um, products for the correct execution of smart contract code. Uh, and the, the, the critical piece there is that it is regulated insurance. So um, some of you may be familiar with products like Nexus Mutual or others that exist uh, currently where largely it's effectively insurance implemented as a betting pool, which works well uh, as, as insurance, but doesn't meet the requirements of financial institutions. This is the difference is we want to make, make sure that we are uh, you know, if a hedge fund or a pension fund or something like that wants to be able to participate in DeFi applications that are being built on chain, they they truly need insurance that they can go to their compliance department and say, yes, this this counts. And so regulated insurance is, is how that we meet that bar. Um, and so the way this starts is we will have regulated smart contract insurance for our own contracts that we launch first. Uh, and then we'll quickly work out um, underwriting guidelines and and sort of the effective effective way that new contracts, new components can be uh, can be insured. So um, so again, tying that back to installations and, and instantiations, the insurance will happen at the installation level. And as a, as a developer coming in who wants to use existing code that's installed on chain, you can instantiate that, that will be insured, you can instantiate it yourself, uh, and now at least that portion of your code uh, is eligible for insurance automatically. So that, that's where we see this going, and we, we're just so excited to, to see how you know, new components, new contracts get built out, get insured, and allow people to just quickly build you know, institutional capable DeFi uh, without having to be the size of you know, Aave, for example, or, or something else that's been running for, for years and has billions of dollars behind them. So yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pause there for a minute uh, before I head into the last section here. I just wanna just ask you from, um, I mean, that sounds what you're doing is a totally amazing and like a breakthrough. Um, have you considered the idea that some of the core tech you're building will be used in other industries outside of finance? Because uh, I happen to be a big fan of a term I created a, recently called programmable communications, which is sort of like programmable securities, except it affects the way that people will communicate. And I'm thinking of everything you're doing actually could help uh, me and my quest of redefining the way we communicate. Yeah, so a hundred percent, and and actually that's a great question as a as a segue into where I'm going here, um, which is, you know, it, it for for those of you that are are trying are listening to this, and you know, if you are new to the Web three world, you may be wondering sort of what's the right way to um, what's the right way to get involved? What are the kinds of things that you should build? Um, what I would say is it the it feels very financialized right now. And um, the reason for that is, is I think, uh, effectively structural, which is as, as a blockchain, what started first was money. And then there were a lot of assets sitting around without much to do. And the first products that made use of those existing users were financial products that let people do thing, financial things with their financial assets, right? So, you know, you saw in 2020, 2021, DeFi applications were really the thing that was hot and the thing that people were building and where all the uh, evolution was. 
Um, and now that's starting to expand, right? As we get more users into the system, more users with wallets that are familiar with how to interact with these products, um, we'll see an expansion and we already have, right? You know, the NFT boom is the start of something much larger. Um, and I, you know, I know it's, it's easy to dismiss things as images or something along those lines, but really NFTs will be also how we represent property rights. Um, and, you know, so there's, there's a huge, huge amount of possible uh, growth that will happen outside of the pure financial realm. And, and yeah, you know, everything that I'm talking about that will be possible for finance, you know, is just as easily possible uh, to, to be useful in other realms as well. Um, you know, again, Dean likes to use the, uh, the analogy with React, where as a JavaScript developer, you know, you can, you can build things in a day that 15 years ago would have taken a team of experts a year to do just because those components exist already. And that's what we hope to do for smart contracts and smart contract um, on Agoric, where, you know, over time, this ecosystem builds out and, you know, DeFi related applications also become useful for managing small parts of communication stuff. And then as people build out the functionality needed to do distributed communication and um, coordination, which may start as governance for our DeFi products that we're launching, for example, you know, we have a whole series of governance components that we have built out um, that become useful in every sort of coordinated application. Um, you know, it, it all just grows. Um, so I, I think absolutely. And I, I realize I'm, uh, go ahead, Santi. Oh, no, no, no. I, I had a question, which was, you know, in the, in the kind of entirety of the web three space and your day to day, what, what kind of other, what other tools or infrastructures are you seeing being built that, that excites you right now outside of Agoric? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I will say that I've been pretty heads down on Agoric for a little while, but I, I think the ecosystem that Agoric is launching into, the Cosmos ecosystem, has some of the most exciting stuff being built in my mind. Um, you know, I, I think there, especially in blockchain, there, there are sort of hype cycles and things like that. And I, the market often gets to a point where it's just really hard to distinguish what's a good product and what's not. But what I found is everything being built on the co in the Cosmos ecosystem has largely kind of avoided those hype cycles. And as a result, it, it's all just interesting people that care a lot about building the technology out the right way and are working to do it. And it's decentralized, so there's disagreements all the time. But I just I'm really excited to see how this evolves over the next year or so. Um, you know, I, I'm, I also have sort of interests in other specific narrow niches at the, at the business level. Um, but I think, you know, between that and looking at decentralized file storage and, um, you know, oracles, uh, that that's kind of where I see things getting interesting over the next few years. Um, well, and so just, yeah, it's great. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And I realize I'm at time. So just just to close out here, you know, I, I think if you're interested in engaging with us more, um, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you to join Agoric's Discord, follow us on Twitter, um, come to, you know, take a look at our documentation, come come ask questions, tell us where we still have gaps. Um, you know, we're we're launching our, our chain is live already, which is just the Cosmos Cosmos level chain. Um, we're launching our VM smart contract framework and our applications. Um, early this year, and then a permissionless mainnet we're targeting sort of later this year. Uh, so between our launch and permissionless mainnet, there are opportunities for builders that I don't have time to to talk about here, I guess. But um, you know, please do engage with us if this is something that is exciting to you. Um, it's certainly exciting to us. Well, thank you, Roland. And it's, it's I mean, it sounds one of those unbounded opportunities for the future is now. So uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs>